the different ways or modes that classical medical students that are approaching questions is kind of two, two groups. One group is using buzzwords or factoids, right? Meaning that you're memorizing, you know, a lot, a lot of facts and trying to then use either, you know, that knowledge of factoids or buzzwords to try to zone in on an answer choice, right? That's one, you know, group of students. The other group of students I would say would be students that are thinking through things more clinically. So what does that look like? That's looking at the question as a whole, um, dealing with the patient's age, the patient's clinical setting, right? The um, risk factors and associations dealing with it and picking an answer choice that encompasses the broad patient is kind of what I call it, or the vignette. Those are kind of the two uh, ways of approaching step questions. Which group performs better is usually going to be the clinical uh, group of students that approach every single question clinically. And the reason why this is, is the test is really moving away from buzzwords or factoids. Uh, maybe 10 to 20 years ago, you could kind of memorize all of first aid or all of pathoma or do a bunch of flashcards and end up doing really well because you're looking for specific words or buzzwords as we call them and pick that answer and get it right. Nowadays, the trend is moving away from that because step one has become pass fail, right? Meaning that there's a higher emphasis on step two. Um, also meaning that the test makers, right, are now trying to prepare you more for a clinical setting. So all these questions are now rotated and focused on uh, on a clinical basis. So looking at a patient and kind of replicating exactly how you would see a patient in real life and then them putting it on a question. So those students that are really taking the, pay, the, the question as a patient are now getting a higher percentage right rather than memorizing buzzwords. Those students tend to be not doing as well as those that are approaching questions clinically. So when students start out, and they always kind of, you know, it, it, it's it's not every student's, um, how do I say, it's, uh, intention, but medical school likes to push a lot of buzzwords and factoids in memorization, rote memorization is kind of what we call it. So to break that habit, because everyone starts out learning like that, because, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? And so memorizing all these factoids uh, causes you to know a bunch of information, but not know how to apply it. And so to break that bad habit of just knowing a thousand facts, but not being able to apply it or not being able to look things clinically, you have to kind of start from square one and breaking down a question like a patient. If you treat the question like a patient and you look at their age, when did it happen? Acute or chronic issues? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse, right? The risk factors, the associations, if you're putting that picture together and you're trying to imagine that patient in your head, that's how you convert yourself from somebody that uses factoids and buzzwords and then transition to a more clinical mindset, which will help you for not only step one, but also step two, step three, your clinical rotations, and in general, become a better physician from day one. MD Boost does a great job, right, of creating questions that are clinically oriented. What does that even mean, right? Instead of the question really rotated on the answer choice being based off of one specific sentence, the answer choice can only be uh, obtained or gotten correct if you take every single sentence and combine it and look at the overall picture. The way me and my team have created MD Boost questions is to really think about how does this patient look in the clinical setting, right? How would you work through this patient um, clinically? And then what would you actually do for that patient, right? Or what is the actual diagnosis using everything that is given? Every single sentence matters, right? It's not just three words and you look at it and you're like, oh wait, that's how you get the answer, right? Our questions are not created in that fashion, unlike other question banks out there currently that are mainstream. And we put a heavy focus on really orienting the student early on in a clinical mindset, not only to get questions correct now, but to get uh, questions correct in the future. I'm gonna now walk you through kind of how you approach a question clinically rather than using or seeing the kind of pitfalls of using buzzwords or factoids. So we'll take a look at 2265, this question here. So I always say start with the question itself saying which of the following mechanisms is most likely responsible for the patient's symptoms 
And then you kind of glance through the answer choices to think to yourself, what kind of system that we're dealing with? You have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. You have disseminated intravascular coagulation. You have hemolytic uremic syndrome. You have immune thrombocytopenic purpura. And last but not least, you have thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is a mouthful for sure. So reading this in my mind, I'm already thinking we're dealing with hematology as the diagnosis is, okay, or diagnoses, right? Um, so then after that, you're going to take a look at the case or the vignette, right? You have a 30 year old woman and I'm highlighting everything that's clinically relevant presents to the emergency department. So I, in my mind, I'm thinking that this is an acute issue with a one week history of fever, fatigue and petechia on her lower extremity. So that's kind of her chief complaint. And the duration is about one week. So fever, fatigue, petechia. So she's sick. Uh, she also reports episodes of confusion, a confusion and difficulty concentrating. So I know there's neurologic symptoms going on with this patient also. Laboratory tests review decreased platelet count, increased lactate dehydrogenase levels, and schistocytes on peripheral blood smear. So these are kind of your lab values that they give you. You have less platelets, right? You have increased lactate dehydrogenase, and then obviously schistocytes. So there's shearing of the red blood cells creating schistocytes. And then now, of course, which of the following mechanisms is most likely responsible for this patient's symptoms? Reading through the answer choices again, I'm thinking about, you know, which one's acute, which one's chronic, what are the associations which each, uh, each diagnosis is given. So antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, this is going to be associated with autoimmune disorders. Um, and in particular, lupus is kind of what we learn about, right? It is the correct age range, but there are no signs, symptoms of an autoimmune disorder at this current time, right? And a lot of times these patients will be hypercoagulable, meaning they get a lot more stroke. So it can account for the confusion and difficulty concentrating. But if you isolate the senescent, you know, that will lead you to kind of picking this answer, which is only one portion of the big picture. So this cannot be right. Okay, disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC is kind of the acronym that we learn or memorize, right? This is kind of where all your coagulation factors are all messed up and it usually happens due to an inciting factor, meaning you, were, you had trauma, you're super sick or septic, right? Or a bunch of inflammation and that's gonna throw off all your plate clients, your fibrinogen, right? You're gonna be bleeding peripherally everywhere, right? You're, you're gonna be very, very sick, low blood pressure, tachycardic, right? In a state of kind of getting really, really sick to a close of death, right? So if you take a look at this whole picture, sure, um, patient has decreased platelet counts that can fit with DIC, but doesn't mention anything else like bleeding symptomatically everywhere, right? No inciting event of trauma or any kind of um, uh, a lot of inflammation or sepsis, right? So if you kind of just look at the de decreased platelet counts and you're thinking either a factoid or a buzzword and you pick this, this would be incorrect. So it's not DIC, it doesn't fit the whole overarching picture. Um, you have hemolytic uremic syndrome or HUS. This is gonna be associated with E. coli or Shigella-like toxin or Shigella, right? So you're thinking about someone sick with GI issues, right? Diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, things like that. And then all of a sudden having, you know, decreased platelet counts and schistocytes. Once again, if you fall into that trap of looking at buzzwords or factoids and looking at decreased platelet count or schistocytes and you pick HUS, right? This doesn't fit the whole picture because this patient also has confusion, difficulty concentrating, right? And, and no GI symptoms. So unlikely HUS, right? Doesn't have kind of that, those risk factors. And then you have immune thrombocytopenic purpura, right? Usually these patients present with, you know, one or two weeks prior having a viral infection or bacterial infection. And then you have this autoimmune reaction where your body destroys choice platelets. Once again, if you fall into that trap of just seeing, oh yeah, you know, immune thrombocytic purpura has decreased platelets, this must be the answer, right? That doesn't look at the whole picture, right? This patient also has schistocytes, right? This patient also has conf uh, confusion, difficulty concentrating. Of course, it can lead to fatigue, right? If there's enough uh, thrombocytopenia, right? But not going to fit the overall picture. So last but not least, you have thrombotic thrombocytic purpura, which is a mouthful, right? Or TTP is kind of what we remember is, right? You might have an inciting factor, right? But the key thing here is you're going to have all these symptoms, right? You have petechiae, right? Um, you have confusion, right? The neurologic symptoms are very key to TTP, confusion, difficulty concentrating. You have decreased platelet counts, right? Because the platelets are getting destroyed and also your schistocytes or your red blood cells that are being sheared. So every single piece of this 
um, question fits clinically right to fit TTP. Okay, so your best answer is going to be thrombocy uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, which is going to be our correct answer here. And always when you're looking at the correct the the explanation of the answer, you always want to pick up a new fact to help solidify the information from that disease process or diagnosis. So TTP caused by a deficiency of Adams S13, um, which is a uh, metalloproteinase that cleaves off on Willebrand factors multimers. They like to ask that sometimes, but one of the key things with TPP that you have to remember is that you have neurologic symptoms, right? You have increased lactate dehydrogenase, petechiae, schistocytes, right? But the key thing that differentiates TTP versus HUS is the neurologic symptoms. They look very, very sim similar, but remember the risk factors, the symptoms, and the overall clinical picture. And that's how I want you to work through every single question clinically, because this not only gives you the highest chance of getting the answer correct, but it's going to prepare you of how to work up a patient that has DTP. What questions you're going to ask? How are they going to look like their age, their, their progression of disease, right? And so thinking about things clinically now will only help you for the future, meaning you're killing multiple birds with one single stone. So let's do questions together clinically.